Greetings, I'm Barry Bolton, President of the Central Sierra Audubon Society. Located in the foothills of the famous Sierra Nevada or Range of Light Mountains, about 150 miles east of San Francisco. You know, most birds can't store food, and so every day presents a new need to find food for the day. That is, survival is a day-to-day -day affair. Although they have their food preferences, they are adaptable. And when the fruit season arrives, some focus on taking advantage of that high energy food in a sort of feeding frenzy. The fruit of the persimmon tree, a native Chinese tree, is a favorite for many species that were feasting in this tree along the main street of Murphy's, California in January of this year, 2021. Fleshy, sugary fruits are primary foods for the cedar waxwing, and because it is one of the latest breeding birds, enables it to take advantage of late summer fruits to feed its young. Since fruit harvests vary from year to year and in place to place, the waxwing has developed a rather nomadic lifestyle in which social flocks search for abundant local fruits. The overwintering and breeding locations for any given flock changes from year to year depending mostly on local fruit harvests. Another social flocking bird is the bush tit, a year-round resident of Western North America and Central America. With a weight of only 5 grams, this bird is a non-stop feeder to maintain body temperature and is constantly on the move to glean insects and their eggs and larvae from leaves and foliage. But, come winter fruit harvest, bush tit flocks suddenly descend on the persimmon fruit, spend a short time foraging and then, just as quickly and suddenly, depart. The Northern Flicker, one of the most widely distributed woodpeckers in North America, is a specialist in foraging for ants on the ground and in anthills where it uses its powerful bill and long sticky tongue to gather the ants. However, ripe fruit is a very attractive food for them which they gather by digging their bills into the flesh and dragging it out with those specialized tongues. As the season progresses and fruit is eaten or falls on the ground, these birds have short, sharp interaction with each other when two or more are on the same tree. The ruby crowned kinglet is another small bird about the same size as the bush tit, but it, unlike the social bush tit, is very much a loner. For most of the year it gleans on the underside of leaves for insects and their eggs and larvae as shown here. But ripe fruit is too good to miss. It arrives singly and leaves when it suits itself, but, like the bush tit, must forage almost every minute of the day to maintain body temperatures and overnight warmth. When I look at the plumage patterns of the red-breasted sapsucker, as with all other bird species, I always wonder about the evolutionary and adaptive elements that drive those intricate and fascinating patterns. Why does one pattern evolve and then stick around for a long time? Why are those specific patterns evolutionary stable? Sapsuckers are so called because they drill small wells in the bark of live trees so that the tree bleeds sap, which the sapsucker sips with a short, hairy tongue. As a fruit eater, it pulls in the fruit with that same hairy tongue.
The red nape sapsucker is closely related to the red-breasted sapsucker, and indeed, they can and do hybridize. Similarly, it also enjoys fruit during the late summer and early winter, and eats in much the same way. Notice how woodpeckers clutch the bark as they hang upside down, and at the same time, their powerful tails stabilize them. The value of that tail is most obvious when the bird is climbing a tree, but even upside down, it is important for stability. European starlings live and forage over winter in flocks that may be small or very, very large, as we sometimes observe in murmurations. The starling enjoys a very wide and varied diet, probably an important part of a successful, too successful actually, short history since its introduction to North America in 1890. Its bill is very powerful such that when foraging for invertebrates in soil, it is able to prize open its mandibles to search for prey. The house finch with that powerful beak was seen to be a prime candidate for persimmons, but was rarely seen on this particular persimmon tree, although the female finch particularly seemed very satisfied with the fruit. The downy woodpecker, smallest woodpecker in North America, quietly and demurely participated from time to time as did several other woodpeckers. What surprised me was the amount of apparent effort this male required to penetrate the fruit and I noticed the same effort with other species as they worked on their fruit. The American robin, just like the starling, was capable of carving off large chunks, but unlike the aggressive and noisy starlings, was generally very shy and reluctant to participate in the feast. Interestingly, the yellow rump warbler seemed to find it easier to grab the fruity flesh than some of the larger birds. As the harvest winds down with the fruits fast disappearing, low-level competition expands to outright aggression, both in one's own species and with others.
This male red nipped sapsucker was enjoying one of the last fruits, but a starling had other ideas about ownership. The sapsucker became aware of the starling's attention and watched attentively, but hanging upside down it was at a great disadvantage, which the starling emphasized by cleverly climbing and towering over him before launching its attack. Although sapsuckers normally stand up to a starling, this one had no choice when confronted with the starling's dagger-like bill while in a vulnerable position. Fruit is important for so many birds, but none more so than the iconic and very photogenic cedar waxwing that looks like a pure work of art. <laughs> 